Welcome everyone to the holidays with our heroes here on Eco Ask Why. Now, next week is the big week. You've been heard some amazing stories leading up to this one today. And next week we have our season recap. And then on the 22nd, the big surprise will be revealed. So you do not want to miss that. Now, on this particular episode, I sat down with Amos Purdy. And you may remember Amos from all the way back in episode 47 and 75. That's right. He was so good, we had to have him on two times and three making this hero, where he talked about what the heck is IIoT. And then he also talked about OT networks and connecting business goals. And I tell you what, Amos, I'm straight up. I'm jealous of this guy. He's got an MBA. He's got an engineering degree. He lives in Wilmington one of the most beautiful places in the world but he is an amazing hero and i know you're gonna love his story you know speaking of those stories we're getting those war stories and they are pretty incredible i'm looking so forward to releasing those out and sharing them with you all now it's not too late to get them in if you got something you know we're gonna be gathering around the christmas tree here next week we want to hear the fun stuff the inspiring stuff so check out the link in the show notes Get those stories to us. We'd love to hear them. We'd love to put a spotlight on them. And thank you for your submissions. Now, it's time to get some insight into Amos Purdy and his amazing journey. Cue the music. Welcome to Eco SY. Today we have a fun hero episode where we're going to sit down with Amos Purdy who is a lead systems engineer at Global Process Automation. So welcome, Amos. Thanks for having me. Man, we're excited, man. I hope you're having a good day. Oh, yeah. Yep. Well, we love these hero episodes and just to get the spotlight of the people that that are making the impact and definitely our heroes. But we love to get started just by sharing your personal story and your journey with our listeners. All right. Honestly, I've been around this data technologies and web applications for quite a while. My mom was in a community college and took me to an HTML class right around the you know, 2000 scare and kind of been hooked ever since then. I did web applications all through high school and college and really focused my undergraduate on computer engineering and linking a lot of those web applications. So been around a lot and a lot of experience around those when web applications were really first starting up. And then as I was finishing my undergrad, I got the opportunity to start working with oil and gas um, driller and really looking at a lot of his remote monitoring and everything and kind of got hooked. The amount of data that you could get industrial wise was way more than your web applications at that time. So it changed <laughs> my whole trajectory really. So went more into Industrial technologies helped my college create an industrial automation course, which has expanded now into a minor and and really start getting more people into the field to really start seeing you know, industrial automation and what that can mean for data and, and going after these technologies. Where did you go to school at, Amos? Wyoming. And actually, I loved Wyoming. Originally from Montana, family moved around with the government down to Nevada, back up to Montana. Ended up spending a lot of my childhood in Nebraska and really remote areas and stuff. So I really <laughs> understood Wyoming when I went there, <laughs> I guess you could say. But honestly, it was a great school. They have a heavy focus on some defense contracting and stuff and just seeing the amount of research that went on there and the amount of really smart technical people and just a great all around place to go. Very cool. From Wyoming, you mentioned you worked in the oil and gas industry. What led you to uh, North Carolina in automation? Um, well, my brother lived out in Charlotte when I graduated and really just kind of wanted to start looking around, seeing what was out there. Figured I'd do a stint in the Southeast for the next decade. And so coming up on that, but yeah, really just the the Southeast had so much of that industrial plants and really the infrastructure and just about every little spot that you could turn for Getting down down to Charlotte was was great because I started I started out with an OEM, so really started to take what I learned from school and really make machines from the ground up. I mean, it, it flexed everything that I knew and what I learned in, in school. It was, it was a great learning experience to, to 
to see every little bit of it clear up to the data side. So. Right. Now, you, I, I, I know we've talked prior to, but our listeners don't know. So you have two masters. You have a master's in electrical engineering and, and an MBA also. So you, we don't see that quite often. So what led to want, you wanting to pursue that MBA? After being out in the industry and being freelance for a long time, going into industry, I could see the engineers have a huge disconnect from a lot of the business. Me growing up doing freelancing, I kind of you know, had to handle all sides of it. And then when you go out and you're super smart engineers, but have little to no experience on what that actually means for the business, it was just like that, you know, light bulb went off. Like we really need to have people that understand what the business goals are and understand that and how it actually applies to the engineering side and what that actually means. So your engineers don't go off on a tangent and you just have to redo stuff. But I just saw that as such a huge gap that needed filled that I just, I needed, I, I understood the engineering side really needed to understand how the business was organized around engineering. So I could be that bridge. Right. Absolutely. Technical understanding with your electrical engineering background. Now you have the business understanding and you're in industry a lot. So I'm sure our listeners would love to get your take on this. What are you seeing as some of the major challenges out there right now? You know, the some of the biggest challenges are some of the most exciting things actually it's the amount of new technologies that we have to deploy and the capabilities of those technologies i think that iot or iot devices edge computing and cloud technologies a lot of these can be very daunting and from a higher up stick higher up sea level pushing a lot of these things down because they're buzzwords and stuff really understanding what a lot of those things mean and how to deploy them and the lessons learned when you try to deploy these new technologies and start to bleed over some of those OT type technologies into cloud applications or really outsourcing all of that. I think a lot of people aren't very comfortable with that. And there's a lot of lessons to be learned in trying to really go after these new technologies. But on the flip side, that's also the huge opportunity. The people that get into it and actually just start doing it, take it slow, get some good things where you feel confident in it and its ability, you can overcome a lot of those hurdles and you can start to work through the problems of what, you know, deploying these new technologies really means. And at the end of the day, it, it's really fun. <laughs> um, I really like doing it. I love seeing the breadth of data that's really, you know, we're starting to get breaking down all these silos and starting to see the transparency between the departments and really starting to get a bigger picture of the whole business. And, you know, it, it's, it's pretty awesome to see what, what can come of it. Just by hearing your, your tone and your, in your voice, you can tell those types of projects get you pretty excited. Is that what you find is driving you right now and you're getting the most joy out of or projects like that? Yeah. The new technologies, it's crazy because when I started, PLC fives were everywhere and it was really hard to go from one process to the other and really understand programs a lot of times, that kind of thing. And their processing power, like, what their processing power was, you can fit in your thumb now. Like, it's crazy to think that technology has come that they can be so much smaller, they're so much more capable, and they can get so much better maintenance and support and just being able to spread that, the connections and the remote, remote monitoring and start to use AI and machine learning to really go after some things that have been perplexing people. Just the capabilities are pretty endless. You know, I think one of the biggest things is I like being in those because it's always a lot of excitement at the beginning that, oh, yeah, we're going to use technologies. It's going to fix everything. But people quickly start to bang their head against the wall and go, I don't know how to do this. But they're not as complicated as you think, but they are completely different. And so those the coming overcome, overcoming some of those small hurdles make a huge impact on businesses. And you can really start to unlock a lot of potential. No doubt. Absolutely. It's great stuff. And having people like you in the field and, and in front of this technology is is only going to take us that much further as a country. And these episodes, Amos, they're really trying to inspire people to consider industry and consider engineering or to come to this vertical and work in manufacturing. What would be some advice you give the, a listener out there who wants to pursue potentially a career like yourself? 
get excited about what you can actually do. There's so many places where you can make such a huge impact if you just have one small idea. And it's crazy how sometimes it's the lowest person on the totem pole that gives you just that one grain of information that just revolutionizes your process and your business and you know really going after that. I would say it, start prototyping. There's a, plenty of options out there for different devices, different technologies. A lot of them are free. Start messing around with them. Start seeing and let you know, let your imagination almost run wild, honestly. The, there's just it's crazy even over the last like three years, the amount of data and free data sets and that kind of stuff that, that are out there. Besides all of the huge edge computing and IoT, you know, improvements that have come the last couple of years. Start looking at a technology or a portion of it and you know start messing around with it get your hands dirty and you'll probably want more right what about you personally any areas that you spend time or resources you consume that you point others to that would want to enhance their personal knowledge or their area of expertise in some of these touch points just looking for some guidance for our listeners here yeah honestly seeing the proliferation of Python as a programming language and how it started to bleed over in just about everything that we can do. And honestly, it, it's a pretty extensive toolkit and you can do everything from OPC servers to, you know, data visualizations to, you know, and your, your machine learning, AI, up to the web, like the, the amount of capabilities around that language is just huge. It's definitely an awesome ecosystem to start looking into. And it's, at least last time I looked, the most popular programming language out there. You learn that one thing, it's in industry. If nothing else, it's little small programs that people have been making and maintaining on the side, but it's getting into industrial applications. And so knowing that programming language and its capabilities really allows you to just expand and know that you're not going to be pigeonholed in your career. So that's been pretty awesome to see how a lot of these technologies developed for other things have been changed and modified and have grown where we can actually use them in industry and start to really just start messing around with stuff that you never thought you could ever do or you had to pay $100,000 to get a machine to go and do it. No, you can you can spin that up for free almost and start doing that, you know? Right. I mean, it sounds like a, if you also, if you get that skill and you fine tune it somewhat, it's a great entry point. And like you said, you're not pigeonholed. You, you have different options and different areas that you could go within industry, but it sounds like a great uh, area to invest time and to, to get better at it if you're looking for that entry. And I, I don't know how you guys feel about even Raspberry Pis, which I wouldn't recommend putting in industrial applications, but even just to start putting your hands on something physical, some something prototyping, something that you don't have to put a lot of money in to just prove the concept something out, like developing those prototypes, you learn so much and why you shouldn't probably be deploying Raspberry Pis out in an industrial environment, if nothing else. You start to get a better understanding of their capabilities and where you can take them. And then it's almost it's hard to contain you, um, if, if nothing else, because if you're the one that can generate some data and some good data, everybody loves data. As soon as you start showing them good information and you know, in, in a way that they can understand, they're ravenous. They just want more and more. So it's really fun to start getting some of that prototyping out there and start seeing some of these things come to life. Yeah, man. The snowball effect really takes into place, right? It just you, you get that mm -hmm. little win. Then you get some cheerleaders, then things start happening. You have more and more momentum. And next thing you have these major projects and major evolutions in your career and great stuff, man. I mean, we also know through a lot of these conversations, Amos, that there, we, we all progress through our career because people help us. People pour into us. There's the, the importance of networking and, and just helping others. So are there any mentors that have helped you in your career that you'd like to give recognition to today? Yeah, my mentor going through college, and he didn't even probably know it until he was my advisor for my master's in electrical, Steve Barrett out at Wyoming. I think he's the co-department head of engineering out there now. It was him seeing that there is some potential there. And really, especially in college, you're learning so much. You're getting overloaded with, with so much. He really helped me start to break down, okay, what is the true path? You are capable in this and this, like, where are you heading? And starting to think about early in 
high school or early in college, although it's never too late, but early in college there where I was getting exposed to a lot of things. And he's the one who helped me get my job in the oil and gas industry. And I helped him create the course for industrial automation and having that support when there's just so much possibility and, you know, really helped ground me and focus me on, you know, my true goals. That was really awesome. He was in your life at the right moment, provided that that guidance and, and mentorship. So thank you for sharing that, that example for us and definitely can see how it impacted you. And I'm sure you're taking opportunities to pour into others and help them in their careers as well as they grow. And I also love to, to, to check with you, Amos. Any highlights, man, any projects that you can look back on and you can say, I was a part of that. And that was awesome. And it may be this uh, course, you mentioned this course that you helped develop at the University of Wyoming, but just curious on, on what your take there from, from a highlight standpoint. I would definitely say the, the creating the course was pretty awesome. We took it from, we, it was, PLCs was a slight side topic in one of our classes to a full, you know, full encompassing course that we got a lot of engineers from not just electrical we got some computer science, we got some mechanical, and really start to expose the cross-functional nature and, and knowledge of those different departments was awesome. To, to see a mechanical engineer go through there and figure out how to program a PLC and then what they can do with it on their bike that they were creating was just awesome. Um, you know, Definitely a highlight, just seeing the capability. And I love being there and being there for support like my mentor was, and I see a lot of engineers not really know where they want to go in engineering. And so helping them over those little hurdles really exposed them to a lot of what you could do and nothing else respect for people that could do it well in industrial applications. And seeing seeing them just, you know, the light bulbs go off was awesome. That sounds like a, a, a really fun project to be involved with and can definitely see why you hang your hat on that. So was there any lab or hands-on portion of that, or is this a classroom environment? Talk to us a little bit more about that, what you developed there. Yeah. So I developed all of the, the labs. So we actually had run some motors, run a, a little machine or a, you know, a little car around, um, but be monitoring different parts of the maze, just some basic valve stuff, but really talking to people around and even some power monitoring, but talking to people around the, the capabilities definitely needed a couple more iterations to get the lab down perfectly, but it was yeah, I created the lab, created a lot of the curriculum that they covered in the actual course. They covered the, the actual filling in the, the course details. I kind of helped guiding that a little bit. But yeah, I mean, and honestly, when I created that, PLC fives were what we had. And it, it's crazy to think about that now. Um, yeah. You, Over a decade you, ago. <laughs> are you able to uh, get out there and, and sit in and, or visit the, the university and see how you know, that class has evolved in, in helping people now? You know, I haven't sat in, in one of the classes or been out there specifically, but I, I talk to, you know, Dr. Barrett every now and then just to see where he's heading. And if nothing else, just I think one of the, the biggest things in your life is the connections that you make. And like he helped me constantly check in on him just to see how everything's going with the engineering department. See if he has any bright upcoming stars that want to be out there <laughs> and doing a lot of what I'm doing. So I've heard little bits and pieces about how it's evolved, but it's awesome to hear about the people that are coming out of that and going right into industry and just everywhere now. Well, I'm just excited there's a class out there that may be lighting a passion or a fire in someone. You know, there may be some content in the lab that you developed that brings the next engineer to industry that develops the next thing for industry 5.0, whatever that may be. It's really cool to think that type of exposure is out there on a regular basis to these young, bright minds. So man, hats off to you. That, that's, that's an amazing accomplishment. And thank you for sharing that highlight with us. And uh, Amos, we, we also like to talk just about joy and fulfillment and where you find that moment of, at, in your current job and your current role where you're having that, where you're the happiest. So if you had to sit back and analyze what I'm doing now as a, as a lead system engineer, this is when I'm the happiest. What are you doing in those moments? <laughs> Honestly, it's when, it's when people actually start using the stuff that, that we deploy and them actually want to keep using it, you know, and, and get engaged in it. And, you know, a lot of these projects and especially the data side, it's hard to figure out what you exactly need to monitor and what you need to get and which plant. There's a whole bunch of intricacies there. 
But when you can sit through the meetings with them, everybody's going through it and we're banging our head against the wall for three months. And at the end of the day, you got to get something out. And so when you take all of those different things and the people that are going to be using it and everything and develop a good user interface that gives them relevant data, actually exposes them to what they really are looking for. It's just awesome to see when their eyes light up like, oh, we have this now? We have this capability? Oh, man, I've been wanting this for 10 years, 15 years. It's finally bridging that gap and getting people to really see everything that they ever wanted to see or get to use something that they actually enjoy using and, and interacting with. And that, that final piece is just awesome when they, when they light up. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, that aha moment where you see it all come together, right? I mean, that, that is awesome. And we love with these episodes, Amos, too, just to get off the career, the job path, and talk a little bit about you outside of work. So anything you like to do for fun, any hobbies or interests that you like to share? Uh, you know, do a lot of fishing and live at the beach. So definitely have to do some good boogie boarding. The waves are a little bit big for surfing right now. But yeah, you know, honestly, just being out in nature and coming from Montana and Nebraska and Wyoming, you know, the open spaces has always interested me. So, you know, out and about, walk through the woods. I think it, that clearing of your head, just not having to focus on work and, you know, really getting into nature and stuff really, you know, it refocuses you, ground you a little bit. No doubt, my friend. We just got back from a family vacation, so I'm uh, I'm officially a semi-pro at boogie boarding. I'm, I'm assuming you're a pro, though, right? <laughs> of course. I mean, have you, have you already bought your uh, $150 boogie board, right? I really got to start investing. <laughs> yeah, I didn't go with the 150 but I did go with, uh, let's see, that thing was about 70 bucks. So it's not the, I broke about four of the ones that are in your styrofoam. And after the fourth mm -hmm. one, I, I threw it in the trash. I'm like, all right, I'm going to get a real boogie board, but yeah, it does make a difference. To that. I've got a, I've got a boogie board graveyard too. <laughs> yeah. So now we just take those, like you said, the, the graveyard of boogie boards, we take those to the pool now because they're still good floats, but uh, <laughs> that do us a whole lot of good when the, uh, the ocean's hitting us, man. Sounds like you have a lot of fun outside, bud. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm Getting out there kayaking and canoeing too, like getting out there fishing, especially being at the beach. It is amazing how your perspective on everything changes when you're even 10 feet off of shore. There's no traffic. There's no, no one around. And it's just a completely different view than you ever thought. Like, no doubt. It's pretty awesome. It is awesome. And you're right there in the heart of where we're, uh, that is, that is the goal for me and my wife. One day we want to wake up and smell that, that salt water and feel it hit you, that sand. And so I'll be there one day, my friend, but enjoy it. It's great. You, you got a lot of cool things happening. And we also love to learn a little bit about families and think you mentioned you're from Montana. You've gone a lot of, a, a lot across the country. Anything about your family you'd like to share with us? Me and my wife have been, you know, together for you know, a good portion of 15 years now. I guess it's, it's about that. Been been married for the last four. So, you know, it's been interesting. I would definitely say her support through all of this. I've moved, I've, I moved her from Wyoming out to Charlotte and bounced around in the Southeast. And she's definitely an uh, outdoorsy person. So that isn't always easy <laughs> bouncing around quite a bit. So if, if nothing else, uh, thank you to my wife. There you go. Sounds like you got a, a good partner there, and hopefully you're in Wilmington together and just a great environment there, man. So thanks for sharing that. Anything that you would point our listeners to that maybe you enjoy from a podcast or a book, anything you're curious about, just try to dig a little deeper on, on things that, that you enjoy. Yeah, honestly, Wall Street Journal has a couple of different like short podcasts in the morning that are pretty good. The Tech Review and just the morning briefing and NPR has, I kind of like the the indicator. You know, it's a little 10 minute short little economic kind of thing. But I think they all fairly quickly catch you up. And honestly, at the end of the day, I'd say a lot of people probably get an information overload. So I try to keep it down the amount that I just, you know spread out all of my attention throughout the day. You know, it's kind of nice to get real quick, brief, and go on my way. Um, but those are definitely pretty good podcasts. The Tech Review from Wall Street Journal and Indicator from NPR. Very cool, man. Very cool. Well, thanks for, for sharing those. I'm sure some of our listeners will check them out. And we love to wrap these up, Amos, with just the why. 
Because everybody has a different why in their life. They have a different drive, a different purpose. If you had to summarize that for somebody sitting at a coffee shop, what would that be, man? I think that there's so much possibility and fun things to do in life. I, I think it really is find a passion and hold on to it. Hold on for the ride. And you get your most satisfaction by seeing a job well done and some results from the stuff that you do. So it can be hard work along the way. I can definitely say that. But the why is that seeing things, something done well throughout my life and just seeing the results of that makes a huge impact in a lot of people's lives and hopefully a lot of businesses' lives. Just being in it and really going after some passion really make, makes you a healthier, happier person, I feel. No doubt, man. We can definitely hear the passion behind you and the things that drive you. And just thank you. You are definitely one of our heroes, Amos. And I really appreciate you taking the time to unpack your personal story, provide inspiration, knowledge to people on, on things that they could consider for their journey. So thank you for your time today. It was, a, it was an honor to have you on Eco Ask Why. All right. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.